in the Center for Art in Woods Beyond the Trees exhibition. Artist Dorothy Gill Barnes creates sculptures from trees. Dorothy works with the tree as it's living, so she could be working and manipulating the bark over a 20-year period. As she cuts the bark and the branches, it grows into certain shapes that she's looking for. And the piece isn't completed until that tree is ready to shed that part of the tree or die. And that's when she removes it from the earth. I talked to her by phone at her home in Ohio. My name is Dorothy Barnes, and I'm originally from Iowa, and I'm now in Ohio. The things that I like to do most in my artwork are outdoors. I like very much to work with wood. I am now adding a little bit of glass once in a while, but mostly being outdoors matters to me and has since I was a child. The wood is very raw, usually. Bark is my favorite material. The springtime, when the bark is softening and I go to look for material, it's a lot of fun. I like being outdoors. When I was little, we had a backyard in Iowa, a place where my sister and I used to play under the asparagus bed and make little parks and things like that. And I often used materials that I would find outside and put them some way into the house and decorate with them. I found ways to do things like decorating the stage when our little village would have things going on. I didn't have any regular art training until I went to college and university. Both places had a little too much of the drawing and the painting was not terribly interesting to me. But I still like to work outdoors and started, I think, designing things from the use of wood and doing quite a lot with materials for my own clothing, quite a lot of sewing. When I graduated, I had some opportunities to show work and then to exhibit and to teach and do other things in different parts of the country where things were very different outdoors in each place. In the time of year when there is no bark and I have to go somewhere else, I've been fortunate to be able to go down to Australia to work where the time of year is different so I can get the bark that will come off. Usually in my part of the world here, it would be through early May to through July. With the knife I can take from a tree that needs to be trimmed or for some reason to share its bark with me, I can cut it and it just comes off just a zip so fun. It comes off really loose and easy to use. So I can work with it directly or I can dry it and even put it in the freezer. I went to Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa first and then I went to one year at Minneapolis College of Art where I started doing some sewing and stitchery and fabric but it didn't go over very well. And then I went to Iowa City where I graduated. That's where I met my husband and we were both interested in art and music. We were married and I came to this area in Ohio where we both taught. And I was able to meet a lot of people and get going with opportunities to show my artwork in other places. I never have had a class in sculpture. I have always loved it and wanted to work in three dimensions. And so I did a lot of that on my own. I sort of taught myself that part, but when I showed my work, then I got invited to work in places where I met a lot of other artists. Everything kind of became three-dimensional, not usually standard, which we call sculpture. It was more playful, I think, and related to nature. How do you decide what materials should be in each piece? It depends partly where I am and what's available. Right now, I'm working with polonia, and we don't have a polonia tree around here, but I thought it was really funny that a tree would have a hole down the middle, and so I'm having a wonderful time getting acquainted with it. I have a friend in the Philadelphia area who's sending me some more something he found along a railroad track, and I'm so excited about it. It's just so fun. How do you come up with your ideas? I don't know. If they tear a certain way and then, then when I tear it off, maybe sometimes I leave the edges rough. Or I find that some of it is thicker than others and, and it just feels good in my hand. And then the shapes and forms that are related to what it wants to do for itself. Some of the best of my things that I've worked with are root things from trees that have come down. 
and I hear the sound of the chainsaws in my neighborhood and just go really quick and see what they've got to offer. Sometimes people are real helpful. People will call me and say, hey, Dorothy, they're taking down this or that. And I get it before it gets in the grinder. I think a lot of my work looks different from the other work. I'm not embarrassed that they don't look alike. If they look too much alike, I would never do them again. Somebody asked me for some of my work, and I tried to copy the one they liked, and that was a big mistake. I've never done that again. The variety is helpful. Dorothy told me she's still involved with teaching. I actually am called a visiting artist at Ohio State in the glass department. I don't get paid. I don't have to pay them. I sometimes do because they work hard for me. But the reason they hire me and give me a space to work, I think, is because they want someone other than people in glass to provide some other ways of working. So I mix up some things with wood and ask them to put glass in it. And it's just a new way of making a variety of presentations to students to think about natural ways to work with glass. Dorothy, I saw you have been very active in social movements. Well, I care about peace, and I'm in a peace organization every Saturday, and we have been for about 10 years. We're a group of nine plus. A lot of other people join us different parts of the year. We try to be part of the Central Ohioans for Peace. I also have been interested in some other things that, that relate to nature and to the community here in Worthington, where we have down here at the MAC. A group of people who come together who care about the arts and music and dance. It makes it very lively for young people, and it's, it's a nice place to go and very friendly. So I try to get over there for events. I don't know, I just come and go from places where I think of my husband and his music. He's not living any longer, but I like to follow the music events here. We have a beautiful piano in our living room. He loved it, and he taught some classes here on Saturdays. But he was mostly at Ohio State University in music theory and composition. So he wrote music as well. I miss the music. Whatever happened to that sister from the asparagus patch when you were kids? Mary Teschner. Oh, well, she grew up and she became a docent in two major cities at the Chicago Art Institute and also in the Naples Museum in Florida. I have my three boys and a girl. All of them are in music and art. And I have a daughter who's a poet. And I'm lucky to have such a nice family. I saw on your website that you were born in 1927. Yeah, I'm 88 years old now. What's the secret to a long and happy life? Oh, I don't know. I love vegetables, and I love chocolate. I like to eat, and I like to keep active. I try to move around every day and going up and down stairs properly, and, but I'm getting really old. I have aches and pains and a sore shoulder, and I wear a back brace occasionally when it hurts. I think I owe my bicycling interest to my good health because I was very active as a bicycler. At least three times a week, I would go 10 miles to get groceries up the hill. I'm really going to try to get back to it. I have one final question about getting older, okay? Okay. Did you ever drink alcohol? <laughs> uh, a little bit, not much. Lately, I have half a beer, and then I put a cork on it, and I have the other half the next day. Well, this makes me feel better because I'm a believer in moderation in drinking uh -huh. is good for you. Yeah, good with popcorn. Popcorn? Well, yeah, when I really have a little fun with my little beverage in the evening or something, I have, a, have my other half of the bottle of beer and have some popcorn with it. <laughs> well, I am heading downstairs now for my nightly beer, and I shall raise my glass to Dorothy Gill Barnes, a magnificent artist and human being.
Renowned artist Dona Look is exhibiting some of her sewn and woven birch bark baskets in an exhibition called Beyond the Trees at the Center for Art in Wood in Philadelphia. I talked to her by phone on a particularly brisk Wisconsin afternoon. Okay, I'm looking outside my own backyard and it's about zero degrees. We have um, 160 acres of white birch trees that we've been reforesting and replanting for 35 years. I create forms by trimming the strips of bark. Frankly, I see the white birch bark as a really precious material. So I don't just start cutting away on my bark. I make a pattern of the whole thing in paper. Then I use that pattern on the bark so that I'm not wasting any of it. I've often seen birch bark as a fiber. I'm cutting it up in strips and weaving it, and it becomes more like a man-made fabric that has a warp and a weft. Birch has to be peeled when the sap is running in the spring. Are birch trees a little bit like sheep? Can you take some of their bark and then it'll grow back? If you peel the bark very carefully and take just the cambium or outer layer, then if conditions are right, that tree will continue to live, and I have done that. I have two or three pieces going at once. I like to take some breaks to back away and look at things before I plow ahead with an idea. I'm slow in my process. With most of my pieces, the bark that you see is almost all from one tree. Each tree is unique, like humans, and the bark has unique qualities, whether it's a certain thickness or color. So I try to keep an overall unity in the piece. Bark has these really unique qualities. It's extremely flammable. It has a lot of resin in it. So it was used as torches. It's also waterproof, so it was used as canoes and vessels that could hold water. Would you characterize yourself as an environmentalist? Oh, of course, yes believe in global warming? I do. It's quite obvious in my own environment. In fact, I don't know how much longer I will be able to work with white birch bark because I probably have to go to Alaska to get it. The older, more mature trees are all gone in the area that I live now. Fortunately, in the last, say, 15 or 20 years, at least on my own property, I see new growth. What I do is really an extension of what my mother and my grandmother taught me as a child. We did a lot of sewing in our house. When I was younger, I started making baskets with a friend just as a fun hobby, collecting materials in our own area. That's how I got started making baskets. But there was a space in there. Four to five years, I lived in Australia of sheep and wool in Australia. I was learning to spin and weave there. And when I moved back to the States, I discovered white birch bark. Started by weaving and sewing, oddly enough, pillows out of woven birch bark filled with balsam needles. And it's just grown from there. How come your mother only gave you one N in your name? My dad's name is Donald. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and I have a twin sister named Nina, so Scottish names. This is an odd thing. I went to a one-room country school. It was very small. And when my sister and I graduated from eighth grade, there were only 14 kids in the whole school, and six of us were twins. Really? So I never thought it was that unique until we went to high school, and I realized it is different. What does she do? She's retired now. She was vice president of a vocational college in Milwaukee. Where did you go to art school? University of Wisconsin. 
they have a degree in art education. I intended to be a teacher. That's actually the reason I went to Australia. I went there as an art teacher. I really enjoyed the kids and the work. It wasn't that enthusiastic about all the administrative stuff that goes with it. And I was more interested in going in my own direction, making my own things. It's interesting, as I get older, I realize I don't necessarily know where my work is. A friend and collector, he was in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and he saw a piece of mine included in a recent acquisitions show and sent me a photo of it. And you didn't have any clue? No, no, I have no clue who, who donated it. They never send you information and say, welcome to our collection. They don't do that. My husband's name is Ken Lober. We've known each other for over 50 years, since we were in high school, so we've been friends for a long time. In 1981, we started working together, designing and creating a production line of sterling silver and 18-karat gold jewelry. A problem came up 14 years ago. Ken had a stroke, which damaged his speech and language center. He has difficulty with conversation, and he's now working with one hand, which is fairly miraculous, I think. But for myself, a lot of my attention that I would have normally put on my own basket work turned to help him get back to work and keep our business going. So now I divide my time between two different studios. I've been thinking a lot about interior space. I think about the brain a lot, partly because of Ken's situation. Thinking about how to take the chaos that's out there and put some order in it. Some of these pieces I have woven the inside and the outside is sewn. Do you have any advice, being an artist who's done this for many years, how to live a good life? I've learned a lot, but I guess what I would tell my son is to always strive to be creative in all that you do, and not just being an artist, but creative in a way that you hope to build a better world or create a better life around you. That means be fearless whenever you can be and spread love. It sounds so simple, but if you express love and beauty in some way, I think it returns to you. At least in my experience, it has been that way. I was strong enough to go out there with my work and very fortunate to meet people that were encouraging me. I have a husband and I have a son. I have family members who really have encouraged me and I've met really wonderful people that felt that what I was doing was worthwhile. Oh, I'm endlessly grateful for the life I've had, being able to work with your own ideas and be totally responsible for what you put out there in the world. So many friends are now retiring. I can't even imagine doing that because I would do the same thing. <laughs> when I started to study the history of basket making, I was so inspired by unnamed Native American, Aboriginal Australians, people from around the world, the things that they created out of materials that were in their environment. And there's a history of what was done with some of these things. I hope that I can expand on that and be inspired by what I've been given.